Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about sanctions, and our guest is Hanie Jodat Barnes. She has a lot of titles. She was a Bernie Sanders delegate uh, to the DNC last year. She is the president and co-founder of Muslim Delegates and Allies. She is the national director of Progressive Democrats of America Middle East Alliances. She is a founding member of the Women's March Los Angeles. And she is heading up something called the Lift the Sanctions campaign that we'll be talking about. Hanye, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, for having me. And uh, uh, yeah, if those were too many titles, I should have just given you one. That would have been more the better. It explains who you are to people. Um, so, so what's what's wrong with sanctions? I mean, aren't sanctions good enforcement of the rule of law, the the wonderful liberal progressive alternative to war, which we don't like? I mean, yay, sanctions, right? Mm, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, there's nothing good about uh, a slow death, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. And uh, sanctions in general, uh, generally speaking, are um, they're punishments against governments that pose a threat in a, uh, uh, in a region of the world. And uh, they're usually imposed uh, as, as a form of a, either a commercial or financial penalty. Um, uh, and uh, they freeze assets. Uh, and it's very unfortunate that this has become a weapon of war in, in, uh, in terms of you know, US. Um, but I call them slow death, David, because when a bomb drops, in a place in a war zone right you die quickly right or someone dies quickly but unfortunately hunger is a um, uh, poverty hunger uh, lack of medicine that can cause a slow death and that's what i say they're they're weapons of war but they kill you slowly so so it's not just a punishment of a government it's a punishment of a population <laughs> which is not exactly legal under the Geneva Conventions, is it? Yeah, no. Uh, normally, um, any sanction that is unilateral um, is not legal, and it, it violates many laws under the UN, uh, uh, you know, convention and um, international law. Um, many of the sanctions that have been imposed on countries that we're targeting are not even. Uh, approved by majority Congress, right? So the president has the, the, the power to really impose them and freeze assets. And uh, no one can really do anything about it other than us really forcing the Congress to take action, right? Um, but um, uh, they do violate the Vienna Declaration of Program of Action. They do violate uh, several human rights uh, uh, council resolutions. So they're not legal. And to your point about, um, punishing the government. Look, governments of the countries that are targeted often don't really care about the human rights anyway, right? So then now you're imposing sanctions on their economy and that cripples the poor and the middle class, pushes the middle class, I would say, um, to poverty and, and the poor is just paralyzed. And the most impacted are the vulnerable communities and, and populations, women, children, those who are ill, who cancer patients. Um, so, yeah. What, what countries are we talking about uh, that the United States government is sanctioning? Well, Iran, for, for one, is uh, right now uh, under extreme sanctions. Uh, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Central Africa, Sudan, Zimbabwe. Mm. Um, Syria. And uh, I think, you know, we can't really talk about Yemen because Yemen is is a whole different story, but largest humanitarian crises in the world. But, um, you know, sanctions are imposed on Houthis by the Saudi government. So uh, it's not directly U.S., but uh, Saudi is a U.S. ally in that yeah. region. So um, that causes a concern sometimes uh, when we talk about sanctions with the, with respect to Yemen. But those are the countries that we're targeting. North North Korea on that yeah. list. Too. Yes, yes. Um, and and 
in in Iran, uh, to take one example, what what is the impact uh, that the sanctions are having, if any, on improving the government uh, in some way uh, and on the population? Yeah. Well, you know, with with Iran, just to kind of give you a general idea of what has been happening, and this is uh, something that you know, many human rights activists, including women who are scholars and free thinkers in Iran have come up against uh, these maximum pressure sanctions. Um, what they're doing is they're freezing assets in banks. And so Iran really um, cannot do any, um, no other country can import anything uh, to the country right now inside. And uh, they've impacted our oil industry, transportation, uh, uh, our banking system. Um, and what they do is, uh, unfortunately, David, what they create is what's called a sanction profiteering system, right? To where the, the, the black, these black markets form um, and um, the oil is sold and then the prices go up in Iran, right? And people who are taxi drivers and people, common folk who just want to go, you know, take their car from point A to point B, can't even afford the gas. And we saw a, an example of that um, in 2019 when our petroleum hiked up by 200% and people revolted and took it to the streets and they were heavily um, punished. Um, and I recall, um, and I never forget this, and I talk about this all the time um, in, in my interviews or when I talk about sanctions, is Secretary Pompeo's very arrogant um, sense of solidarity with Iran when he said, I stand in solidarity with the people there, um, and, and this is just to kind of cripple the government, when what he was doing was actually the very opposite. He was crippling the um, people of Iran, but the government is going to be the government, right? So nothing really changes. Um, but, um, yeah, people are affected and, um, right now in the midst of a, a pandemic that's so global and it's so, um, deadly, not having medicine, um, in Iran, not having, uh, equipment, respiratory equipment, just the very basic needs for nurses and doctors, they're not accessible. And, um, yeah, that's where the concern comes in. So, And Hanya, you used the word our because you are from Iran? Yes. Yeah. Born in Tehran. Spent my childhood there. And, um, you know, I was, I was uh, born after the revolution. And uh, towards the, the end of the Iran-Iraq war. And I lived long enough in Iran to see the atrocities, the pain after the war. Uh, the country never recovered. The country hasn't recovered since the coup of 1950s against Mossadegh when he decided to nationalize our oil, right? And that's where Iran became a threat. And, and right. that region becomes a threat normally, you know, to the U.S. and it gets penetrated because of its geopolitical resources. So, um, but after the war, we haven't recovered um, much and sanctions have been imposed on Iran since late 1970s. So um, it's not like they're new, but it's something that we have learned to live with in Iran and they impact our community heavily. It, it seems that if sanctions were going to do what they supposedly are intended to do, that is turn people against their own government rather than against the governments imposing the sanctions, they would have worked by now in Iran or my God, in, by now in Cuba or North Korea, where it's been even decades longer. Um, have they ever worked as supposedly intended? And if not, is that actually what they're intended for? Well, they're intended to, to punish the government. And just like you said, turn the government against the, turn the, the people against the government, but they never work. They sim sanction simply kill and they're slow. And uh, they're, they're silent war machines that people really don't understand. Um, and um, I, can, I can say for Iran, no, it just, but, but, but kind of to your point and, and your question, you know, do they really work? And um, it, I think People who live under sanctions, people who live under poverty, hunger, are going to always be the enemy of the United States, right? Because they're innocent people, right? They're innocent people that are being punished for 
political transactions is what I call them, right? And and uh, you know, uh, for their for their government's doing. And I think when you put someone in that situation where they can't even afford to buy bread, or or the price of cumin, you know, are 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 are, are equi well, equivalent to a dollar, decreases in our economy is so crippled. Uh, you're going to breed hostility in that region towards America. So it's actually th those countries that are under sanctions become national security threats. Yeah. And they kill. They kill women, they kill children. We saw that happen. 500,000 children died in Afghanistan in the 1990s. Something that uh, Madeleine Albright, Secretary Albright, boasted about on 60 Seconds and her response to whether it was worth it. So I think it's 60 minutes. It's 60 minutes. Worth, worth about 60 <laughs> seconds. But, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, she, she she said a half million dead Iraqi children was worth it. I asked her about that uh, years later, and uh, she was sorry she said it. She she wouldn't say she was sorry she did it, just that she was sorry she got caught saying it. Mm -hmm. It's on my on my YouTube uh, channel. Uh, honey, it's, a lot of people get confused about sanctions, but aren't they good? Weren't they good against South Africa? Aren't they good against Israel? Uh, and it seems there's a... There's a bit of a distinction when uh, sanctions or a BDS campaign are supported by the people impacted uh, and are aimed at targeting the government rather than punishing a population in order to start a war. Um, it, there, there is some sort of a distinction uh, between a, a, a useful purpose for some sanctions and the way that the U.S. government is sanctioning places like Iran, isn't there? I mean, BDS is completely different from, or, or the concept of BDS is completely different from the sanctions that are currently being imposed on Iran, right? Um, we, through the BDS movement, and again, I'm in no position to talk about Palestine because I feel like someone from, from that region of the world should be, you know, uh, discussing that. But uh, I think in terms of BDS, we're um, really pushing for a uh, cut on the military and sanctions on military that's being sent to Israel. Right versus, you have economic sanctions on Iran on and and assets frozen to where people are dying because they just can't get simple basic um, um, medicine. Right. So there's a difference. Well, we need to we need to sanction the shipping of weapons to anyone everywhere. I mean that that's that's not punishing people. That's helping people. Um, we're speaking with Hanye Jodat Barnes, uh, who's working on something called Lift the Sanctions Campaign. And there's there's a petition uh, that people can find through RootsAction.org and WorldBeyondWar.org and other websites. What is the what is the petition about? Sure. So what, um, and, and, uh, and thank you for partnering with uh, PDA Middle East Alliances on this initiative, David. I know you've been a, you've been a tremendous ally and, and, and support, really. Um, and what really we're hoping to do through this petition is ring the alarm, really, and let Congress know to support and, and urge the Biden administration to issue general worldwide um, worldwide general licenses to allow for the importation of devices, medicine, food, basic equipment uh, that um, during COVID, right? But it also is urging for Congress to really study sanctions and see if they are truly as helpful as America thinks they are, right? Having a broader look at what sanctions really are and are they in fact effective um, is something that we're calling for. And this campaign is designed to engage and involve grassroots organizers also to become more active on social media in sending a message across. I have said this previously, um, you know, a, a number of times, I feel like because we have so many um, social and racial justice um, issues here in the US that we have to work around, right? People don't often talk about sanctions that happen in different countries that are so far from them, right? Um, but I think this campaign's purpose is to ensure that we're pushing the Congress to really get behind uh, legislation and bills that limit the president's power to act without any consequences. 
right? And um, we just just need support um, from any Congress member to really support Ilhan's uh, bill, that Ilhan, uh, Representative Omar's bill uh, that was recently introduced, as well as uh, um, just um, kind of uphold that education piece as well through advocacy. And, and what is Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's bill? What is it called or what does it do? Mm -hmm. Well, there was one uh, that was introduced by her uh, in, in 2019, 2020, that was co-sponsored by um, uh, representatives uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, as well as uh, Rashida Tlaib, and it's uh, the HR 5879 that really limits the president's power to impose sanctions uh, uh, really without, um, uh, uh, you know, congressional approval. And it's uh, it limits the duration of a declaration of national emergency by president, right? And it, it forces the president to um, ensure that um, sanctions don't impact um, water infrastructure or civilian healthcare facilities and, uh, uh, you know, educational facilities or energy infrastructures, right? Um, and she just recently issued a letter with uh, Representative Tree Garcia and Senator Warren uh, that was heavily uh, endorsed um, by some of our allies in Congress and uh, Senate uh, to, um, you know, really, again, touch upon some of what the bill talks about. And so we're hoping to be able to, I've, I've been in, trying to get in contact with her uh, um, foreign policy director to talk about what's next and how we can as delegates to the, to, um, the California Democratic Party help um, push this bill forward or the letter even, so. You, you would think that during a disease pandemic, you could get some movement on humanitarian steps uh, that perhaps you couldn't otherwise, but the, the whole logic of sanctions is to punish people. Uh, so I, I don't know, um, where, where, does, where does the bulk of Congress seem to be uh, on, on, on the issue of sanctions uh, in Iran and other countries? and on the question of restoring the agreement with the Iranian government? Well, that's a whole different, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of the, the JCPOA, I can, I can confidently say that um, we, as the United States of America, were the ones who pulled out of the deal without Iran violating anything really that was uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the agreement. And even I say, Historically, looking at it, a year after we pulled out of the deal, Iran still abided by the guidelines, right? So I think this was a this was more um, a vendetta against Iran by the Trump administration for um, you know in, in support of some of the allies uh, of the U.S. in that region. Having said that, um, there was in, there was a letter that was just recently issued um, with an overwhelming number of. Um, also, Democrats, uh, Democratic Congress members uh, signing on to it. Um, that is um, in opposition, stands in opposition with us uh, joining the agreement as it stands. Um, and I think that is, um, again, you know, if we want to as a country lead uh, with diplomacy and compassion, we have to really be the first to initiate. And this was a Biden campaign promise anyway, David, right? That he's gonna he's gonna join the conversation and, and lead the conversation in terms of the Iran agreement. And we still haven't seen that happening even now, months after he's been elected. So I'm really urging him to, uh, yeah. um, to really take a look at what's happening in Iran as a humanitarian crisis rather than a, you know, political, um, you know, uh, what about is or he said, she said, and I'm urging both countries to come to the table, not just America. I'm also urging my own uh, government to take the first step and th they are interested in joining and they're interested in having a conversation with the Biden administration, but we don't see that happening right now. So it seemed that for, you know, a long time before Biden finally moved into the White House, uh, people who were observing Iran were saying, that uh, the United States would need 
to end the sanctions uh, and reform its own behavior and rejoin the agreement, uh, and that if it didn't uh, in the next months, uh, come summertime, uh, Iran was likely to have elections and get a new government that would want much less, if anything, ever to do with any sort of agreements with anybody, and the time would have, it would be too late. Uh, well, here comes Biden into the White House, and for weeks and weeks, nothing happens. Uh, then there's the demand that Iran meet some, some new demands uh, from Washington before Washington will talk about rejoining the agreement that the United States pulled out of, not Iran. Uh, it's, I mean... Does, does it, is, it, is it conceivable that this isn't intentional failure? Is there, is there actually an intention here to succeed in arriving at an agreement? Look, David, there, the notion that the U.S. is now all of a sudden the world police is really troubling to me, right? Uh, America is the deciding factor in who lives and who dies is a huge concern, right? I mean... Again, you know, like I said, I, we, and this is where we come in as grassroots activists, is we have to really mobilize behind putting Congress and getting Congress to urge the Biden administration to come to the table, right? And also really stay on top of uh, constituents of those who signed in opposition to uh, the agreement, right? Um, I would say the sooner the better. Because with the hardliners, if the hardliners are 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 uh, come to power in Iran, um, we may not even have that discussion happening anytime soon. And again, it's the people dying. So um, we just have to really uh, make sure that, as a united voice, we rally behind what's just. And. Uh, you know, I said this to you just earlier that, you know, th it's troubling that the U.S. Is, is the world police when the movement for black lives has taught us, you know, that there's a cry and, and need for help here in our country. Yet our Pentagon budget is at, what, $740 billion. And we, you know, larger than the next eight countries in the world. And uh, we're now telling people how to lead in democracy and... I, I hate to I hate to quibble with gargantuan numbers that we can't even comprehend, which make the point. But that does leave out all the nuclear weapons that are in the Energy Department. It leaves out the Homeland Security so-called department. It leaves out the mercenaries in the State Department. It leaves out enough to get you to one and a quarter trillion dollars uh, being dumped into U.S. militarism. And just in the past week, we saw this story come out of nowhere with no evidence that Iran was planning to attack an army base in Washington, D.C. It seems, I mean, how, how better to sell these military budgets uh, to Congress, to the public, through the corporate media, than to have Iran as an enemy? And, and so again, I, I see these supposed failures to learn the lessons of Trump's failures in North Korea and Iran and with China and with Russia and, but the peace, the peace and agreement seem so easily obtainable in each of these examples if they were desired, if somebody actually wanted them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced the so-called failures here aren't intentional. They sure as heck sell a lot mm -hmm. of weapons. They do. And they protect the allies that we have placed uh, strategically in that region, right? And again, like I said, you know, for, for the longest time, that uh, region of the world has been penetrated by the U.S. for its resources. So what better way to also have control over that region, whether you have your, uh, I mean, look, we have our, uh, we, we've caused the, the largest uh, refugee crisis in Afghanistan, David, right? We've been there for decades. And and what's really interesting, and I want to mention here for people to, to, to keep in mind, is that when we went into war with Afghanistan, we pushed Afghans to Iran. When we went into war with Iraq, we pushed Iraqis into Iran. They're second-class citizens in Iran. These sanctions that we were talking about and have been talking about for the past, you know, a, a good 20 minutes or so impact those people more, right? So these are refugee crises that happen as a result of U.S. Uh, imperialism, U.S. wars. 
and then other countries' economies cripple because now we have to clean up the mess. And we're under sanctions now too. So we can't even feed the Iranian people and let alone, you know, you have the, the most vulnerable population of Afghan and Iraqis who need protection, support, medicine. They sought shelter in Iran. They can't even get that. So um, yes, it is strategic for the US not to join the JCPOA. Yes, it is strategic for the propaganda machine to sell weapons and secure that area for natural resources. But I also um, think that um, with the rise of the progressive movement, there's also a generation that is no longer idly sitting by and watching. Now you have more people from the Middle Eastern community engaged in conversations about foreign policy and you have the progressive movement um, pushing against these corporate agendas, uh, wanting to demilitarize. And you have one of the largest mass movements in history, the Black Lives Matter movement as a part of Movement for Black Lives, uh, um, speaking to the inconsistencies and the social justice um, the violations of human rights here in this country, which then makes us think about, well, where does this money go? Why is it yeah. there that our military budget is $740 billion and we have the largest population of homeless uh, men and women sleeping on the sides of the streets, yeah. student debt that we can't pay back or we can't even, Medicare for all being the number one cause of uh, bankruptcy here in this country. The lack and of imagine. Medicare for all, yeah. Yeah, so Hania, Jodat Barnes, we have a minute and a half left. What what can people do? Uh, where should people go? How can people follow your work and get involved with the Lift the Sanctions campaign? Sure. So um, we, um, again, the Lift the Sanctions campaign was a part of a, a Progressive Democrats of America Middle East Alliances initiative. And uh, www.liftthesanctions.org is where you want to go to um, uh, look at some of our tools that we're providing and some language that we've crafted for you to contact your Congress members and uh, ask them to uh, issue or push the Biden administration to issue these uh, general licenses and, and allow loans and uh, 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 you know, uh, medicine and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, you can also follow us on Twitter uh, at PDA Middle East Alliances. And I'm sure World Beyond War is going to be a, 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 an asset and an ally to this movement. So um, you all can contact me through David. <laughs> you, can, you can find, we'll put some links up on talkworldradio.org uh, to everything Hania is talking about, and you can find the petition through worldbeyondwar.org and rootsaction.org. Um, Hania Jodat Barnes uh, was a Bernie delegate in 2020, is president, co-founder of Muslim Delegates and Allies, is the national director of the PDA Middle East Alliances, and is a founding member of Women's March Los Angeles and is working on the Lift the Sanctions campaign. Mm -hmm. Hania, thank you for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. It's a pleasure. Thanks. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.